Good evening and welcome to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello and uh, it's wonderful to have your company here tonight. So this is a format which is hashtag not Q&A. Uh, basically what a lot of people that I talk to are sick and tired of is a Q&A episode on Monday nights on ABC and it ruined my dinner a little bit when I was watching it tonight because there was non-stop talk along a single track narrative. It was a huge echo chamber and the token conservative who was on the platform was completely intimidated and cowed into going along with the party line and not contradicting false things that were said. So we're that on the opposite foot. Uh, for a start, I'm a host that will admit my biases. I'm Christian, I'm conservative, and that's where I'm coming from. So filter what I say through that, ask questions, look up the answers for yourself and think for yourself and uh, just see if it's my bias or if it's uh, facts and objective truth that's coming in. But we like to have a conversation that's uh, free flowing and open. We want to keep the show moving along, but we also want to give our guests time to get into and unpack their thoughts uh, a little bit more. So welcome to the show. You, the viewers, will be an important part of this. We uh, invite you to make comments, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Um, if your uh, avatar and your profile picture is clean and your comments are civil and on topic, we'd be happy to put them on the screen as, as much as possible and include them in the show and, and maybe even talk about them. Uh, so to start off tonight, the uh, first guest that I want to welcome to the show is Dr. Anthony Dillon. Anthony, welcome to Palo Talk Live. Uh, hi, Dave. Now, you're a lecturer at um, the is it Australian Catholic? Which university? I'm sorry. It, ACU? Australian Catholic. Yeah. Okay, great. Australian Catholic University in Sydney. And uh, your heritage, uh, part Indigenous, part what else? Part English. Part English? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so what, I guess one set of my ancestors owe rent to the other set of my ancestors. <laughs> well, well, I think I have a very similar thing. I'm part part British, part Scottish, and uh, yeah, the land clearances where the Scots were dispossessed uh, by the Brits again um, owe rent to the other half of me. Uh, and another person uh, who's got mixed ancestry, as I think just about every Australian does, is uh, Mark Powell. Mark, you're a pastor at uh, Cornerstone Presbyterian Church in Strathfield. Did I remember that right? That's right. I'm actually just down the road from Anthony. Anthony's about uh, works at ACU, which is like a kilometre from where I live. Uh, that's awesome. Now, you're uh, part South Sea Islander. Yeah, I grew up, um, my mum and dad, you know, uh, my dad was from Mackay, up near Queensland, and uh, yep. always sort of talked about having a Kanaka um, background with South Sea Islanders. Uh, Kanakas were like basically people that were brought over to work um, on the sugarcane plantations, but not, a little not bit far more, apart from slavery. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they were called, yeah. like they were colloquially, you know, blackbirded. Um, yeah. But I think a bit more research into our history has sort of shown that my first ancestor was a Jamaican who came over as a free settler um, to yeah. Australia. So, okay. but a lot of my relatives identify as being Aboriginal. And do you like reggae? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And a big welcome also tonight uh, to Jacinta Price. Uh, Jacinta, you you are a councillor at uh, Alice Springs um, Town Council and uh, you're also uh, a Indigenous Issues Researcher for the Centre for Independent Studies. Did I get that position and function right? Director of Indigenous Research. <laughs> Director of Indigenous Research. There we go. Uh, thank you yeah. very much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me again. You've been making uh, some good headlines this week with the Daily Mail um, in, in the UK, I think, picking up uh, an interview that you did uh, on Paul Murray. And uh, there were some really awesome things uh, said there. And uh, one of the issues we're going to explore later tonight, which uh, I've invited Jacinta back for, is that she's a particularly clear voice on uh, the other issues uh, relating um, to the situation and, and prospects of Indigenous people uh, in Australia. And, of course, uh, our final guest tonight is Andrew Cooper. Andrew is the Director of Liberty Works Australia and he's also the Director of CPAC Australia. And uh, how long did it take um, to get CPAC here to Australia from the time it, it first occurred to you, Andrew? 
Well, it was uh, it really only took about ten months in the end. It was a world record pace, and uh, wow, we uh, we uh, we made a handshake deal with the ACU, the American Conservative Union in the US, which run the famous CPAC uh, conference in uh, Washington. Uh, I met with them, and within a couple of hours, we had handshaked, and uh, ten months later, we had uh, what I thought was a magnificent conference in Sydney. So uh, Jacinta was there, and uh, yeah. there's a whole bunch of others there, and uh, the Labor Party tried to bring us, take us down, but uh, they haven't, and, um, and that, that we'll be reloading right. and going again. <laughs> now it was. Uh, what was the name of the award that uh, Christina Keneally won? The well, it was uh, it was it was the uh, CPAC Free Speech Award, but we renamed it the Keneally Cup. Uh, That's right. And it gave, by Craig Kelly, uh, thought it was a great idea to do that, and I thoroughly endorsed it. That it was presented to Christina Keneally in her absence uh, because she did the most uh, that anyone did to promote CPAC and uh, we'll be uh, awarding that uh, Keneally Cup to someone someone new this year. Some other uh, wonderful far-left person who's opposed to the concept of people disagreeing with them in public. Yeah, there's a lot of candidates, right? So uh, it'll, be, it'll be difficult to sift through them. Mm. Yeah. Um, now, tell me, what's, what are the plans for CPAC this year? It was a fantastic conference. It was action-packed. Uh, I loved the, the people that were there. We got to uh, meet... Um, some people who, uh, who's the gentleman who's now um, President Trump's chief of staff? So Congressman Mark uh, Meadows, he was the I was uh, going to say that. I, th I thought that was him. He, yeah, he's a, he's, he, was, he was a very prominent um, uh, um, congressman in his own right for the Republican Party running the Freedom mm. Caucus, which is essentially the largest uh, faction in the Republican Party. Uh, and he uh, he's uh, recently become, uh, well, just really as the coronavirus hit, he's become uh, Trump's chief of staff. So uh, uh, his timing uh, timing couldn't have been more uh, challenging for him, I think. But uh, you know, and we we and whilst we won't expect Mark uh, to attend, uh, we'd expect some messages from Mark uh, during the night, so or, or the day of CPAC. So that'll be that'll be good fun. Well, I thought uh, you know it's. It I was just stoked that here in Australia we had the the caliber of speaker uh, come to a conservative conference who within the year was appointed chief of, Stra of <laughs> staff to the president. So yeah. you need to come along this year if you haven't been already and, and if you have then you'll obviously want to come again. But uh, come yeah. along this year, you never know who you're going to meet and who they'll be um, very, very soon. But um, what's the plans for this year? When's it on? And um What's it looking like with uh, restrictions now lifting? Well, it's hard. It's hard to see what's happening with international travel restrictions, right, Dave? So, um, mm. uh, you know, we were hoping to get our American friends back over again, but it's very difficult to plan for that. So we've we've decided to embrace probably the most significant and most controversial presidential election in the history, of one of, you know, in the history of the nation. There, and uh, we're going to have CPAC on. Uh, U.S. election date, which will be fourth of November for us here in Australia, and uh, we're gonna yep. we're gonna have a party, right? Regardless yeah. of what happens, we're gonna have a big party. We're gonna have some great speakers, and it'll be a lot of so fun. That, and so yeah. that's gonna be in Sydney again. That'll be in Sydney. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. And we'll be able to uh, hear all those speakers and and watch the American election result at the same time. Are you expecting a uh, a Trump landslide, narrow margin, or uh, what's your prediction, Andrew? Uh, Dave, uh, I, I, I've given up trying to predict elections over the last, you know, three or come four on, years. Be so, brave. Uh, <laughs> be brave. We'll, we'll come I back got to you. no I'll idea, go, mate. I'll go first. Trump okay. landslide. Trump really? landslide. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> my, my reasoning is uh, we've got the Democrats at the moment who will be too gutless to come out and oppose the defund police narrative that's coming out. And the vast majority of Americans will not vote for a, a that risk. That, that surely that's too much of a risk to vote for. A I, I just look at Joe Biden. I think how can they vote for him? You know, I just think you'd just it put was a already up, enough. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's and in the bag for Trump. <laughs> just into, who do you think in the bag for Trump? Oh well, I just I I cannot see Joe Biden. I mean. He doesn't even know how to lead himself, let alone an entire nation. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm for Trump. <laughs> Dylan Oakley says no competition in the US election. Seriously. But now, look, a bunch of conservatives are going to say that. But, uh, yep, all right, it's it's on the record and, um, and we're going to be playing this uh, on the 5th of November just to remind everybody what their predictions were. Mark Powell, <laughs> uh, what do you think? Uh, 4th of November, Trump 
a chance, big chance, no chance? Yeah, I think he's a big chance. Um, I, you know, look, there's a there's a lot to be critical of Trump, but he's done a lot good. That, that is good. Um, I think, like what has already been said, it, there's not really much opposition that they're going to put up. They don't. I don't think that the left or the Democrats have put up a compelling narrative or a compelling vision that will capture the hearts and minds of Middle America and most of the American people. Yep. Anthony, what do you think? I think it changes week by week, and that's what it's like with a lot of elections. So at this, you know, it'll, it'll all be what happens in the couple of weeks before, I think. That'll, yeah, that'll be, it, it, uh, does, it does change a lot. Uh, uh, a half hour is a long time in politics these days. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, look, uh, Andrew, a big... Uh, aspect of of your political activism and advocacy over recent years has been not starting not only CPAC but the um, the Liberty Fest conferences before then, with a, a very libertarian, obviously um, deliberately um, flavour to the conversation and the debate and the conversations, and arguing for that. Tell me, what's your analysis of the uh, COVID restrictions that we've seen, um, the case made for them, the process to implement them, and the public uh, reactions to them? Yeah, okay. I, I, you mentioned the word libertarian. I, I sort of do consider myself a libertarian. I think, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan uh, used to say that uh, within the heart of every conservative beat it, you know, there was a libertarian. And so I, I sort of consider myself that. And the two creeds really with uh, libertarians are is that you don't hurt people and you don't take their stuff. And you think about what's happened over the journey of the last few months, uh, particularly with the riots. You know, we've had uh, uh, what I still consider the, a, a policeman you know, acting viciously and uh, murderously on an individual. Uh, that, that obviously breaches everyone's sense of justice, I think. Uh, but then the rioters, uh, you know, uh, taking, you know, you know, just rampaging through uh, some of the cities in the US in particular, um, thankfully very respectful of property in the main here in Australia. Uh, but mm. I think that, 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 that sort of breaches my sense of um, righteousness as well. And the thing about the COVID restrictions too, and, and I'm, a, I'm a real unlock, you know, we should be unlocking Australia. Uh, we should be allowing people to take control of their own take personal responsibility for their own health. We all know what we need to do if we don't want to get the virus, right? We need to keep mm -hmm. our distance. We need to wash our hands. We need to do all those things, and that's within our control. Um, having having a government forcing us to, make, you know, to, to, to keep us in our houses, keep us away from our work, uh, in some cases um, destroying businesses, uh, destroying uh, the livelihoods of many people, uh, and, and, and the people that are making these decisions aren't in that group right they're all they're mm. all floating above all the rest of us um i think it's been um i think it's been a real tragedy actually um now i can understand uh politicians um being a bit jumpy at the beginning but uh right now uh you know right now uh we should be opening up and um, we've got one person in icu in the whole country we're set up to take seven or eight thousand uh you know the narrative changes all the time uh, and for me, I think the government forcing us uh, to all lock down and take this pain that's not shared amongst all of us, uh, that breaches my sense of, uh, of right. Uh, and um, I think it's immoral, to be perfectly honest, David. Yeah, no, I, I do agree. Uh, Andrew uh, Ellie Melly on last week, Alexandra Marshall, um, says conservatives are libertarians with safe words. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, uh, Mark, what do you think is the path forward from this? We've we've seen um, the the lockdowns be justified over and over and over and over again, and and then all of a sudden, ten to thirty thousand people in the one space, no problem. Yeah. Look, I think as just has been said, um, it's really deeply, deeply concerning. Like as a Christian pastor, for for months now, um, people haven't been able to attend funerals of loved ones. Um, in, in, in the capacity that they want to, or weddings. Uh, churches have been locked down. Um, I, think, I think overall, um, I think Christians in Australia from all denominations have really done their utmost to honour the government reg um, uh, restrictions. And then all of a sudden, like that, Gladys just opens the floodgates and it's like 30,000 people can just go into the streets and it's like COVID never happened. Um, 
I, I think it's um, deeply, deeply disappointing. Um, the political damage, I think, for Gladys Berejiklian will be will be massive. Um, she's already on the nose in, in New South Wales for how she treated the abortion issue and just railroaded that through and did a deal with Alex Greenwich, um, the uh, independent yeah. uh, MP here in Sydney. Um, what's the way forward? That's a really great question. Um, from where I sit as a pastor, I think Christians will continue to, um, you know, uh, take the vow of honouring the government, following the restrictions, doing what's safe. Um, but I think a lot of Christians are now, and if I can just speak for the Christian community, I think a lot of Christians are, are really seeking to get back to meeting together. And it's can I just say, it's for, I think it's for the good mental health and well-being of our community. Um, I know in Northern California, suicide mm. rates um, have been massive. They've had more suicides in Northern California in the last couple of months than they'd normally have in the whole year. Um, I think part of the riots around Black Lives Matter is actually people feeling, you know, lo- you know, being socially isolated for so long. It's like it's just, just lit a, a match and it just exploded and, and sparked this whole thing, as well as the issues that are just um, bubbling away underneath. Um, what's the way forward? Look, I, I really hope that nothing happens in terms of a, a second wave of infections. Um, I hope that we can open up the economy because that's going to be the big issue going forward. Um, you know, I thank God that there hasn't been more um, uh, cases of COVID um, and deaths uh, in Australia than we've seen. That's a great thing that I'm really deeply thankful for. But also what we need to think about is actually helping one another and the economy and the future uh, generations of Australia who are going to be saddled with so much debt. So there's a long way forward out of this. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. Anthony, you wrote a uh, really good piece um, at the beginning of the week, which has got some really great reaction. Uh, and the, the title of your article was Black Lives Matter Protesters in Australia Are Just Renter Crowds. Yes, yes. Um, what, what do you want me to say about it? You want me to talk about the article? or? Yeah, share the article a, a little bit. Uh, Summarise uh, your thoughts. Renter crowds is um, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit rude, isn't it? <laughs> oh, that was probably the number one criticism. Oh no, the the first criticism was how dare I say that Aboriginal people in custody are less likely to die than non-Aboriginal people in custody. Okay, and yeah. um, just well, me, the facts are racist. About. Yeah, um, but yeah, the, the actual renter crowd bit. Um, people, the you know the Idiots didn't realise a renter crowd just means uh, it's, it's a figure of speech. It means people who turn up to the crowd who really don't know what they're there for, who will just go along, you invite them along, and they'll they'll come along and protest. So this week it's Black Lives Matter. Next week it'll be something else. And um, just something else quickly, Dave. You remember when yep. we spoke last week and you were talking about me being on the program and I was saying, oh, look, mate, it's 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 so touchy at the moment. Mm. I'm only a very general things i'm a little bit hesitant um but as we've seen there's a lot of people who have had enough of this and they're mm. speaking up and striking yep. back so i certainly feel a bit more confident tonight oh, um, good. than what i was five days ago when we had a chat because things were a bit more volatile even a week ago so yep well i can uh, i can relate to that because i was watching q a tonight and <laughs> last night's q and I was just watching before the show now and, and I didn't get to watch all of it. But the, the pain and anger uh, on on the words and and voices and, and faces of the Indigenous people on that show was, was palpable. I can't deny that I'm seeing that pain. Uh, I can dispute and debate where it comes from, what causes it and, and what's keeping it going, but there is a heck of a lot of conversation going on about this. And and I think what I don't like about the show that I was watching was that there was no challenge at all to the narrative from the people that were claiming to be objective. And I'm like, well, either don't claim to be objective or challenge the the narrative that's going on there. And, and specifically, um, you know, we, we have to have this conversation with a lot of sensitivity and and I'm not going to apologise, but I want to, I guess, stipulate up front for anybody that's, um, you know, going to 
be offended by anything that's said tonight is ask more questions. Don't choose to be offended. Choose to ask more questions and 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 figure out. Um, racist is just a, a reflexive, lazy response to hearing something um, that you don't like. Um, and I'm not a racist, and I don't care if you believe it or not. Um, but if you want the truth and you think I'm sounding racist, ask more questions um, because what I'm sounding like isn't isn't the reality. Um, and let's have a better conversation about this. And I'll assume you're being sincere and it's uh, just the least that we can all do for each other uh, if we're actually heading for reconciliation and racial harmony. Um, bad assumptions is is not a good way to go. Um Jacinta, uh, you you had some fun things to say um, about about these people that we're protesting. So, the mm. the article that um, uh, got published for you, which was essentially summarising uh, words um, that you said on a, a show, was that you're sick to your stomach um, because Black Lives Matter protesters um, aren't interested in Aboriginal deaths unless they're killed by white men. Um, I can tell exactly what you're talking about when you say that, but um, there's a heck of a lot of people who will misunderstand that and misinterpret it. What do you mean by that? Well, for the simple fact that the majority of Aboriginal people that die at the hands of other human beings die at the hands of uh, their own uh, outside of custody rather than inside custody. And the... The Royal Commission into Deaths in Custody, they found, I mean, they went in on the preconception that uh, right. that there must have been racism at play, that there must have been foul play uh, going on for there to be deaths of Indigenous people in custody. And the findings absolutely ruled out this preconception. Mm. So... Uh, you know, you're no more likely to die in custody than if you're uh, non-Indigenous. And what the problem was is that Aboriginal people are incarcerated at a higher rate. And as I keep saying, almost 70% of Aboriginal people incarcerated are incarcerated for violent crimes. And Aboriginal people are, even though we're only 3% of the population, we are the majority of victims of crime in Australia. <laughs> and over 80% yep. of those victims of crime, um, uh, we, our offender is known to us. So it's either family or a partner. And so what really uh, upsets me is the fact that so while we have so many victims of crime, it's the perpetrators that these protesters are far more concerned with. Mm. Uh, you know, if a, if, if a perpetrator is um, goes to jail and uh, it dies of natural causes, which is the leading cause of black deaths in custody, then there is an uproar about that. But not necessarily if that perpetrator happened to um, have killed an Indigenous person. That's not what they're interested in. And they talk about we want to lower rates of incarceration. We want to end Aboriginal black deaths in custody. Righto. Well, let's begin by getting our family uh, and, and those in our community to stop hurting our other family members and community members. But that, that's where it all stems from to begin with, but that's completely ignored. Um, and just going back to talking about uh, the lockdowns and, and COVID. Uh, so while I'm, I, I sort of have to uh, walk two lines with this because one, uh, you know, obviously I, I come from, I live in an area where there are the most vulnerable Aboriginal people um, in the country. And if COVID were to get into any of these communities, it would it would cause absolute devastation. And of course, this, these were the cries that took place when, uh, when Australia first started experiencing cases of COVID-19 uh, to the point where there was a uh, article in uh, SBS and ITV where um, the the author claimed that if Scott if there is to be a devastating outbreak and Scott Morrison is seen as doing nothing, then this can be likened to genocide. Once again, 
you know, it's going to be a white person's fault if COVID-19 gets into a remote community and it's going to be the government's fault and it's going to be genocide. Well, we haven't had that. But what we do see then is <laughs> Black Lives Matter protesters going out against social distancing restrictions, um, effectively putting themselves and their families at risk of contracting the virus. Uh, and so I guess if we do see in a couple of weeks a second wave as a result of these protests, well, they certainly can't. Are we going to, well, are we going to blame activists for genocide? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it, it is. It, 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 that's, and that's the objection. Um, sorry, Mark, uh, I saw, um, I can't remember his name right now, but there was a, uh, and Alexander Downer was commenting that uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, the rights want, um, the, the right want restrictions ended, but then complain ab about the protests. And I, I replied, uh, Mr. Downer, no, we're, we're not complaining about the protests. We're complaining about the hypocrisy of holding the protests by the people who have been swearing black and blue that it's not safe to be within one and a half metres of somebody mm -hmm. else. Uh, and Jacinta, you're, you're exactly right. Um, they take the biggest risks with the biggest at-risk community in this while saying that this community is at risk of not having its health concerns taken seriously. The, the hypocrisy could be cut with a knife. It was it was terribly disappointing. Mark, sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, you know, I think Jacinta, like a lot of people in Australia, have a lot of risk, and Anthony, have a lot of respect for what you say and what you do. Um, and I guess a question, a question to you, um, you know, as an Aboriginal man and as and, and as an Aboriginal woman, do you feel like there is systemic racism within our country that is holding people back? Uh, and if not, what are the issues at play? Jacinta, do you want to go first, or you want me to? You can go in, first, and in, I'll, I'll I'll follow I'll follow up. <laughs> no, Mark, there's not systemic racism. Um, now, as soon as I say that, there, there are going to be people who will then twist it to say, Anthony says there's no racism in Australia. Nonsense. Um, there's racism, but it is not the big culprit. It's not systemic. It's not what's holding Aboriginal people back. Um, and look, I, I, I use an analogy because, you know, like I said, some people think you only have to show a case of racism to then claim that Australia is racist. Well, I know some very rich Aboriginal people. Um, they've got wealthy incomes and, and good on them. It would be foolish for me to then say, well, Aboriginal people are a rich race of people based on the incomes of a few wealthy Aboriginal people. It's, you know, that's more the exception, those um, rich, wealthy Aboriginal people. So it is with racism. Yes, it happens, but it's certainly not the big culprit um, holding Aboriginal people back. And these days too, what constitutes racism? My goodness, it's you know just got to be the the tiniest little thing, and the amount of uh, mental gymnastics you need to twist that into being racist is just ridiculous. So, yeah, Jacinta. racism is the systemic racism in our country and this was also ruled out in the findings of the royal commission into black deaths in custody that it's it wasn't systemic racism at play and yet this is what the narrative is and this is what a lot of our left-wing media run with and to me I, I see I don't see that there is um you know, to, to push for a false narrative is to effectively uh, create more division, is to maintain division, is to maintain the rage, uh, is to make sure that this so-called process of reconciliation doesn't actually um, take place. So, and the biggest issues that we're faced with is the family and domestic violence issue it is what is leading to high rates of incarceration not racism it's leading to high rates of incarceration it's it's ensuring that the homes of our children are unsafe uh, you know our women and 
and our children aren't being abused um, and, and, you know, for some their lives aren't being taken away by racism, this is happening uh, at the hands of our own people and it's easy to um, use racism as an excuse because it then means you don't have to take responsibility for the situation that's going on in your own backyard. And as you know, I'm 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 so fed up with this argument um, continually. You know, this perpetuation of this idea that racism is the biggest issue that we're faced with as Indigenous people, and this is often being pushed by very successful Indigenous people. Mm. Uh, and, you know, if you speak to, and what, what we don't ever get to hear from is actual Aboriginal people from the bush whose first language is in English. You never hear them in these conversations. It comes from Aboriginal people who have had the opportunities that this country has given them, which is an education, um, you know, which is the, all the access to services and ways of, uh, you know, harnessing the tools to survive and thrive in a modern world. If we lived in a racist country uh, and it was systemic as is being claimed, well, we'd still have, we'd be, li we'd be living in apartheid. We'd have, um, you know, rooms for black people, rooms for white people. Um, the funny thing, however, is that universities are pushing for this sort of thing for segregation, right? <laughs> That's where I see the systemic racism. That's where I see it. Safe yeah. places um, yeah. in the creation of safe places. But otherwise you know, the referendum took place and the overwhelming majority of Australians which showed their support and their allegiance to Aboriginal Australians. And now what we've got, fast forward these decades along, what we've got is people who seem to have forgotten what's happened in our country's history, seem to have forgotten that, uh, you know, what what this country has given us and, and where we are now. And if 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 we're if we're standing up on Q and A and able to have, get, get, getting the opportunity to to uh, express emotion raw emotion uh, you know I didn't see it I saw a snippet of the monologue um, which straight away made me think think of Mary G and her song Poor Bala Poor Bala Me but <laughs> um, you know. Really, if we're living in a racist country, you wouldn't have those opportunities if systemic racism existed to the point where we're being told it exists. Mm. Yep. Thank you, Jacinta. Uh, big thank you to Pello Talk Partners um, because of the small monthly donations that uh, you guys regularly make. Uh, I'm able to keep doing this work, spend time researching and um, working with uh, collecting these wonderful guests to be able to come and have these honest, uh, in-depth conversations uh, with you. If you'd like to become a Pello Talk Partner, please head to my website, davepello.com uh, forward slash donate. Uh, there's lots of articles and uh, videos on that website as well that uh, you can get into and, and um, have a look at. Um, one of the articles I wrote back in 2018 has uh, been revitalised, uh, talking about black deaths in custody. Some of these issues just are evergreen and uh, always relevant. And it's an issue that we should be very concerned about, um, but in a, in a way that's um, equal actually equal not selective as, as Jacinta um, said so uh, we have M Jack commenting I was so offended to hear Dr Dylan was called a racist slur by a university teacher why wasn't she reprimanded now I don't know what has or hasn't happened um, with that but uh, here's the tweet um, Dr Dylan uh, shared that there can be no greater confirmation that my work is having a good impact than when fragile snowflakes are triggered because they can't find fault with my work. Uh, and uh, Dr. Charlene Leroy Dyer says to Anthony, shame on you. What kind of black fella are you anyway? Coconut. <gasps> and uh, that would be the racial slur. And we can tell Anthony's mortally wounded. Um, <laughs> But he responded uh, very, very uh, immaturely and, and just calling her names. I've asked people to point out flaws in my views before and they never do. Perhaps you will be different. Uh, sorry, no, that was actually intellectual and mature. Uh, she replied, no one can be bother reading your dribble to pick flaws. 
and you are well known for your verbal abuse of women who don't share your views, um, which was on display who was abusing who in this exchange. Uh, and so you offered uh, to use, no one can be bothered to reading your dribble to pick flaws if I'm ever being demolished online. Um, well known for asking women and guys questions for which you, like you, can't answer. Um, so, yeah, uh, Anthony, is this the kind of um, conduct that passes for professional excellence uh, in Australian <laughs> academia? Uh, no, but it's the uh, kind of behaviour that passes for snowflakes. Um, <laughs> it, it's all too common. Jacinta knows what I'm talking about. Um, and look, I was chatting to someone else about this today. It's very interesting. Comments like these and terms like these don't worry me or disinterest in the slightest. Um, it just, you know, it's a reflection of how insecure and how silly they are. Uh, what I'm concerned for is um, when white people say the sorts of things we're saying, they're called racist. Okay, they get called racist. Mm. Now, when a white person is called racist, that's a label. That's mud that sticks to them. Um, mm. And so I, I think it's it's more serious when they get criticised. When Jacinta and I get criticised, um, doesn't worry us, and everyone can see that the person criticising is an absolute dope. Um, so yeah. yeah, they do us a favour. They they help us gain more um, support. Really. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, if that's the if that's the very best a person has to offer in a debate. Mm. Well, yes, it, it, it makes one party look good and the other party look very dopey. Yeah. Um, Andrew, do you ever try and have a conversation which re relates or at least discusses the actual numbers and statistics of, of uh, what's going on in our justice system and uh, what we can interpret from that? Um. I do, but uh, for my observation, um, there's a, a real uh, serious case of cognitive dissonance going on uh, with most people, with many people that are uh, personally involved in this issue. And I can't speak on the issue um, uh, with the authority that others can, but um, it appears to me that the statistics, and Jacinta mentioned it uh, earlier, that um, that the death rates of Aboriginal people in custody, if anything, is slightly lower than the uh, the rest of the uh, incarcerated population. It's the incarceration rate that's the problem. But if you ask, if you present this argument or these statistics to the person that's emotionally invested in the issue, uh, they don't. They either are unwilling to to uh, to listen, or, or you know, cognitive dissonance is when when they're actually so emotionally uh, entwined in the issue that they're actually unable to listen and, and mm. take in the information. And I think that's a real problem. And 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 the trouble is um, what I've observed and what we're all observing now is that there's this swarming of uh, virtual signaling going on where every university, every big corporate name, uh, you know, they're, they're swarming in behind this Black Lives Matter um, uh, kind of narrative and uh, the facts don't matter anymore. They really don't matter. And, you know, I, I look at Jacinta and Anthony and, um, uh, and and another one of our speakers that we've had many, Warren Mundine, and they speak very eloquently and they back up with all the facts and, and yet they get horribly abused and, um, um, mm. you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's awful what you see on some of their Facebook posts there, but it just wouldn't be tolerated anywhere else. But because it's uh, it's coming from their Indigenous brothers and sisters that for some reason we seem to think that this is okay. And uh, and the, the virtual signalers just leave it alone. Like they don't they don't they don't stand up and try and protect these people who are who are speaking with facts and and, mm. and sensibly on the issue. So um, to answer your question, uh, I think it's really important that the facts are out there and then we keep repeating them. But I think at moments like these, it's just an irrational swarm of virtual signaling and we just got to wait a little while until it starts to die down, to be perfectly frank. Yeah. Mark, there's a few comments uh, coming up talking about reverse racism. Um, do you describe yourself? I, I don't even know you this. Well, I know you fairly well, but um, we've had some long chats. But do you ever describe yourself as a person of colour? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> not where I find my identity. I mean, look, first and foremost, I'm a Christian, 
So, and that's the thing. Uh, in my church is mostly people, it's like the United Nations, actually. We've got mostly Asian um, people from Fiji, um, one or two Anglos, um, people from all over the world. Um, and we don't actually, I think, I think you know that racism is gone when you don't see race. Um, that that's the key. Um, mm. And you know, Martin Luther King said in his famous "I Have a Dream" speech, "I have a dream when people will not judge me on the um, color of my skin or the, my children's color of their skin, but on the content of their character." Um, mm. And so I just, but to back up a little bit, um, the Black Lives Matter thing is interesting because I think most, and I see this even with Christian people. They've changed their Instagram, you know, pages or anything, or Facebook pages, and they're supporting Black Lives Matters because what they're really saying deep down is, I believe that all races and cultures are equal um, before God, and um, and I think they are of equal value. I think everybody agrees with that, but mm. that's not what Black Lives Matter stands for. Right. Um, I think everybody listening tonight should just go and Google Black Lives Matter. Go to the website. This is a radical. Um, really, I think, ultimately anarchist um, organisation or movement that wants to destroy the nuclear family, uh, mm -hmm. that wants to destroy heteronormativity, um, then I think Jacinda picked up on this in, in, in about her community. There's this brilliant video, and I, you might be able to show it, Dave, where Dave Rubin is interviewing Larry Elder, an African-American, mm -hmm. and he yep. says, what's the problem here? Is it systemic racism? And like Jacinta so rightly said, and Anthony, no, it's actually the issue of fatherlessness. It's yes. the breakdown of the nuclear family within um, those communities. Um, and Dave um, Rubin had that red pill moment, which he himself described, where he just said his eyes were open and he, all of a sudden he saw it for what it is. Um, just quickly, I was a pastor in um, a little outback town, Jacinta has probably heard of it, called Weewar, out near Moree. 40% of the town is Aboriginal. My children went to a school, 50% were Aboriginal. Um, it was um, tragic just to see how many people in the town were, were raised in families that were Aboriginal that had no father figure. Mm. Uh, and the, the effects of that on, on wives and on, on, on children was just heartbreakingly massive. Uh, I saw kids go from, I would teach them scripture in year six, and they would be prostitutes by year seven and year eight at high school, uh, wow. pregnant with a number of kids before they left. That's heartbreaking. Um, yep. and there's actually more complicated issues than people just want to easily say, hashtag, you know, black lives matter. Of course black lives matter. All lives matter. Yep. Um, we, we want to affirm everybody, well, particularly me as a Christian, everybody's yep. made in the image of God. Everybody's equal. Everybody's precious. Um, you know, Warren Mondine, i just say this in closing because I know this, I'm sure, um, you know, Jacinta and Warren will come in and say some helpful things here. But, you know, Warren mentioned that our government gives $30 billion a year um, to helping black communities. $30 billion. Yep. The Australian government and the Australian people, I think, are trying to do all that they can. The question is, though, and I'll flip this to Jacinta, it's obviously not working, um, mm. and we really, I think, need to do more um, to actually address the core issues. And I know Eliza Main in the comments section asked that, you know, when we get past all the sloganeering, past the riots, past the looting, what can we really do to help Aboriginal people? Mm. Absolutely. And the, I think the, the main thing is also is not to throw more money at it because clearly there's an abundance of money there available and we're going to have to, the, the, the purse strings are going to have to get tightened because now we're going to be left with a debt to deal with, as you mentioned before, for years to come with regard to the impact of COVID-19. So what the government has to do and get tough with is instead of just, um, you know, throwing money and, and getting you know, getting bureaucratic um, documents back with a tick and flick saying, you know, this has been spent here and this has been, there. and then, you know, our leaders can stand up and say, you know, we we put this amount of money here and this amount of money there. We actually need to figure out where this money is having an impact and where it is working. Because what's happened is we've got, 
not only, you know, are Indigenous people uh, suffering because of welfare, but we've got an entire Indigenous grievance industry that is totally reliant, reliant on government welfare. So, you know, Ken White's just announced that he wants to find measures, you know, um, to decrease incarceration rates. Uh, and then you've got leaders of Aboriginal uh, organisations saying, well, actually, you need to throw more money at, money at us in order for us to solve this issue. And, and, you know, it should be up to us to solve this issue. Well, I'm sorry, but these Aboriginal bureaucracies have had decades to do as they as they claim you know that they've been doing which is to improve the lives of aboriginal people so it's now time for the government to hold these these aboriginal bureaucracies to account for the billions of dollars that have been uh you know we don't know where they've gone you know that that's the thing we don't know where they have gone Hold them to the same account as everybody else. Start treating Aboriginal people, Aboriginal bureaucracies, just as everybody else, equal to everybody else, other Australians in this country. And, you know, got, talking about that as well, the whole Black Lives Matter movement, they they, they look at police as, uh, as people doing a particular job and held to a particular standard, but they will not hold their own people, our own people, to the same standard. It's that yep. racism of low expectations and yep. Aboriginal people allowing that to be played out and handing over our agency and saying, we are victims to racism and white people, we are not worthy of solving our, our own problems. White people are responsible, but white people aren't going to solve their problems. <laughs> yep. Uh, here's the some of the statistics uh, from the book that you pointed me to um, earlier on today, um, Jacinta. Um, substantiated notification rates of child neglect and abuse, um, comparing the rate per 1,000 people in Indigenous and non-Indigenous populations. Uh, and we can see it's broken down by various states, um, but in, in New South Wales, just on the top, uh, it's 55 rates of child neglect and abuse per 1,000 people in Indigenous communities in New South Wales and less, you know, nearly, uh, what's that, an eighth, uh, nearly a tenth of the, the rate. So that eight to ten times. Uh, it, it's 55 per 1,000 compared to 6.3 per 1,000 in, in non-Indigenous communities. How big of a problem... I know the stats for America, and uh, and I don't know if it's because it's a lack of recording and reporting in Australia, or because American culture is just so um, pervasive uh, through our our consciousness. But um, seventy six percent of um, of African American families are fatherless. Is it a similar rate uh, in in Australia? I'm not entirely sure of the the rate of of uh, a fatherless but I, i'd say it, it, it would have to be particularly high because it is prevalent as far as i know without having um statistics in front of me yep uh is anybody else on the panel familiar with uh, a, a quotable um even even ballpark number anthony i've never seen one um isn't that interesting it, yeah. isn't isn't that a bit of a comment in itself um, that these figures aren't really well known, um, but uh, yeah. Well, it's because we'd like like to look elsewhere for the crux of our problems. We're not looking in the right places. Well, well, it's a very similar um, problem to to what um, Warren was talking about uh, last week with with sit down money, uh, and that was basically that the advent of the welfare state. Um, really became the beginning of, and look, credit for good intentions. Like the the uh, the left side of politics that introduced these social safety nets, actually, uh, you know, were trying to do good things. Um, but you know, the 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 result has been abysmal. The result has been social chaos. The result has been. Uh, communities becoming dependent on the government in, instead of traditional family values um, and and community itself. Um, and surely we have to 
look at the whole picture and and say if we're trying to solve the the cultural problems that are going on here uh, fatherlessness is the root of so many social problems including incomplete education uh, broken marriages uh, al uh, substance abuse and criminality it's such a constant predictor of of adverse outcomes is going to be broken families and so what can we as a community do to to fix that the hard part i think you guys have been saying tonight is that that actually makes us look at ourselves instead of blaming somebody else the government the society around us the laws and people um of of a different color uh feel free to jump in anybody if you've if you've got um anything to add right here i think well, i might jump in and just make the observation so fatherlessness um uh can be a indicator of you know a dysfunctional family environment obviously but the question is what's the what's the cause of fatherlessness um and i i really um and it doesn't matter what community you're talking about there's plenty of mm. Communities that do suffer from, uh, you know, higher rates of families without fathers, with young boys without fathers that are causing problems. And, you know, to me, uh, and this is a hard, this is a hard thing to say to people that um, are affected by these sort of comments. But, you know, it's welfare. I mean, welfare, welfare is almost like a drug. I mean, you give welfare to anyone. It doesn't matter whether you're Indigenous, not you know. You give welfare to a family long term over many generations. It's like a drug, and it's so damn hard to get off. And yep. um, and the damage that being on that drug can do to any society. And you see it. You see it where they used to have the housing commission homes together. You know, clustered together in Melbourne, for example. And everything yep. that went wrong, they broke all that up because they realised that having clustered air. Uh, uh, clustered communities and suburbs of welfare recipients was just a recipe for disaster. And I, I honestly fear that, you know, a lot of these Aboriginal communities um, are basically similarly, they're just welfare, they're welfare towns and it's very destructive. Yeah, can I just say, Dave, I think I sent you something just from the latest Australian Bureau of Statistics 2018. I was looking at this. Um, it's less than 5% of Aboriginal people are in a married relationship at present. Um, that's that's the data, um, so it's um, it's staggering. I mean, like the, there's people that are divorced, there's people that are separated, there's people that are widowed, people that are never married. Um, so this is a summary from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Lone parents by marital status, lone parent households, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, Australia, 2016. Um, mm. Never married widowed divorced separated married um so that's lone parents um mm. with uh yeah, yeah. some pretty oh, high the, rates there yeah. lone parents yeah i'm not so, sorry i shouldn't say that it was just um you know uh, all married people but the lone parents yeah and um and that's that's um fatherless families there that that first yeah. column uh about 62 percent it looks like yeah um thanks for sending that through sure. um now i want to wrap up the show right now um but uh don't stress if you're watching we're not going away we're just uh ending the formal part of the evening we're going to uh keep going for a little while yet at least half an hour there's a lot to talk about. Uh, right now, we're going to move into examining um, the the incarceration rates. What's the cause? What's the possibility? Um, clearly, uh, you've got more chance of dying in custody, according to the data, if you're white. Uh, but there's a huge problem of black deaths in custody, and we have to face it, and we have to be honest about it, and we have to look for solutions, which will require honesty. Um, but that's going to be in the next part of Pello Talk Live. It's hashtag not Q&A. Uh, right now, I uh, just want to thank uh, our um, panel for participating tonight. We have uh, the opportunity to follow them, uh, Jacinta Nampajimpa uh, or at Jade Nampajimpa, which uh, I'll spell it for the people on the podcast. Hey, opportunity to to promote the podcast you can get this whole show uh on your favorite podcast channel and for those people listening and not looking at the spelling on the screen you can find jacinta on twitter at j-n-a-m-p-i-j-i-n-p-a 
And Anthony Dillon is at Anthony W. O. Dillon. Is that uh, warrant officer, Anthony? <laughs> no? <laughs> uh, middle initials. Middle initials at Anthony W. O. Dillon. Uh, and uh, Andrew promises he will uh, watch his Twitter account tomorrow. He's not often engaging with it, but uh, he's at Liberty Works AU, uh, and that's with a KS, not an X, at Liberty Works AU. And Mark Powell is Mark Powell, double L, 0728. So make sure you jump onto Twitter if uh, you have an account there. It's really great for uh, studying the uh, animals of the extreme left. Um, and uh, it's uh, something that we want to, um, I guess, expose ourselves to other ideas and, and see exactly what they say and, and try and find a civil argument to uh, justify their decisions. Uh, but thank you very much for watching. We're about to move into overtime and uh, you'll be able to get all of these uh, videos tomorrow on YouTube and Facebook, and we'll also be uploading uploading topical clips uh, through throughout the week to the Facebook channel as well. And don't forget, you can head to uh, DavePello.com for email updates. And I promise I won't send out a newsletter every week, although I try to. Um, and uh, that's it. So, thank you very much for uh, joining tonight, uh, everyone. And um, we will see you in the comments section. Now, moving on to incarceration rates, um, it's, um, I guess the question is, is um, why, are the, why is there a disproportionate, nearly 15 times um, the population percentage of Aboriginals uh, represented in incarceration? Um, uh, Anthony, let's start with you. Uh, feel free to assess things you've heard as, as well as just your your opinion. Yeah, sure. Well, well I mean, crime the big one, obviously. Um, having said that, if Aboriginal people um, had access to better legal represent representation, that might bring the numbers down, but we shouldn't use that to, you know, tiptoe around the fact that um, they're committing a lot of crimes. Um, and, and there's a lot of victims that go along with those crimes. Um, and I know Jacinta deals with them regularly. Um, now, something else I was just re reading last night is for many, and I don't know how many percentage it is because uh, no one does a survey on these things, but for a lot of young Aboriginal blokes, it can be seen as a rite of passage going into jail mm -hmm. when so, so many of their peers have done it. So, I mean, that's another factor that's... Um, contributing to the elevated rates and it, but when we talk about this you know people want to know the solutions uh, you know what's the ultimate cause and i think if you don't bring it back down to basics if we can have aboriginal adults in meaningful jobs and if kids can see adults aboriginal adults working as being normal that'll solve a lot of the problems because when they see that adults are working and that's normal they then understand the importance of school and the parents understand the importance of school because they know that school leads you to, you know, gain meaningful employment or go to university or whatever. So, um, yeah, you know, there's the high crime rates, but what contributes to that? It's you have, you know, high rates of unemployment, that sort of thing. Jacinta, do you want to add? Yeah, look, definitely welfare is a huge factor. Uh, I think if you're... Um, there's, there's the low socioeconomic issue, there's the welfare issue, the welfare dependency. Uh, and I think from my part of the part of the country where I come from, I, you know, I talk often about the cultural factors that, um, that basically encourage violence, uh, you know, um, where we're sort of wait, waiting the process, the judicial process to take place after uh, a nephew of mine was murdered last Friday, and uh, that was as a result of a, an ongoing family feud. And um, you know, I, 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 I've had a lot of media try to ask me questions around this situation, and and I, I one won't talk about the details of it based on the fact that there is a judicial process taking place. But also, but what I will say is that there is
acceptance of violence. It was used as a means of social control. Uh, you know, all in in all human history, violence has been used as a means of social control. But obviously, we've still got a lot of culture intact, and there is a uh, there is an active push to ignore um, that this is this is contributing to the rates of violence, which is contributing to the high levels of incarceration. Uh, and, and there's a total... We seem to be having trouble with uh, Jacinta's connection there. I promise that wasn't me. Um, but uh, we had, um, had a, com a, uh, a comment here, um, and I just want to see if I can bring that up. Here we go, M, M Jack. Um, M Jack says, I'm uncomfortable with data that shames one people group over another. Let's target the issues without shaming. Who wants to speak to that? I, I agree. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes there, there's no nice way to talk about a bad thing. No. Um, and it comes, uh, if we just look at the Aboriginal issue for a moment, if people build their sense of self-worth on being Aboriginal, like many of them do, well, then, of course, they don't want to hear anything bad. Now, I'm mm. a Queenslander, right? But I do not build my sense of self-worth around being Queensland, Queenslander. Therefore, if I hear some bad news, read some bad stats about Queenslanders, it doesn't worry me. I think, yep, that's fine. It's got to be spoken. Mm. Um, so, yes, let's not deliberately sensationalise things, but let's also realise that we have to discuss these things, the good, the bad and the ugly. Mm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, Anthony. Um, you, you can't really address the, the issues uh, until you actually identify the problem. If mm. you go to the doctor and, you know, you've got, you know, severe pain in your back um, and it's not muscular related, you want him to actually get to the bottom of, is it a cancer? Um, you want him to find out the exact nature of the problem. Um, mm. In the same way, I, I, I don't think anybody here on the panel tonight, anybody's been trying to shame Aboriginal people. I think everybody's come with a heart to think what can we do to help the situation, but you can't help the situation until you actually know what the situation is. Yeah. I, I just, just seem to got cut off because, um, and I know it's not your fault, Dave, but she was making some really excellent points um, that, and I think this is the way forward, is actually giving people um, ownership um, of the, the situation and how they might even be contributing to that situation in their communities rather than infantiling them and just thinking, well, the government is just going to, you know, keep giving handouts and, and, and uh, will solve all problems. Yep. Um, I don't think that actually helps Aboriginal people. Um, yeah. uh, it infantiles yeah. them. And, and, and yeah. that's, that's not right. That's, that, that's inherently, I would argue, racist. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Coming get, um, just very quickly, talking about the bad things, which uh, gender is overrepresented in prison? Yeah, males. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a problem um, hearing that. I mean, I wish that it wasn't the case. I, you know, I don't want to see people in prison, but given that that's how it is, I am happy to talk openly about that and say, men, let's get our acts together. So, mm. yeah. yeah, that's brilliant. And the good news is uh, Jacinta's back turns out pedal power um, is needed. Um, you'll have to talk to the Alice Springs uh, Council about that, Jacinta. Oh, I'll tell you what, I've been having issues with my NBN, I'm sure. Someone's just trying to take my internet so I can't contribute to meaningful debate. <laughs> oh, it's still really bad. Um, you're, um, you're sounding a bit like a Dalek on a Doctor Who episode. Um, <laughs> let's see if it gets better while I read some I of these comments. Um Criminals are overrepresented in our prison system. Something must be done about it. Um, <laughs> did, you, Dave, did, you, Dave, did you see what I sent you? I sent you a, um, a comments about the rites of passage. I did. I did. Yeah. Let me uh, let me see if I can open that up. Um, I think I've still got it on my clipboard. Yep. All right. Let's uh, have a quick look at that. Um, unscreened. Trusting you. Um, <laughs> uh, M. Jack, um, who is uncomfortable about data which uh, seems to be seen as shaming, is uh, trying to make a point here, and it's a good point. There's a lot of crime in Anglo-poor suburbs, and, and yes, um, 
that's exactly why we look at data, um, M. Jack. It, it's because uh, we need to look for patterns, and and if they tell us something that is uncomfortable, we need to tell the truth and be honest about it. Um, but this article says. Young Aboriginal people consider jail a rite of passage, WA Chief Justice says. Um, a, so, um, yeah, look, uh, I haven't fully processed the book that you sent me today, but I've had a, a good look through it, Jacinta, and, and there's a um, conversation from there. It's a great analysis of, of lots of other research and opinions, in, including the Royal Commission. And... Um, and and part of them essentially is, is saying uh, that there is this, uh, I guess, propensity um, to to commit more crimes. And this is the the kind of thing that you're saying you want to see the some honesty told about, uh, and and that is to to actually acknowledge the fact that there's a heck of a lot of violent crimes being committed um, within families uh, and. Uh, the person who wrote the book, I, I, what was his name? Weatherburn. Weatherburn. Don Weatherburn. Don Weatherburn. Great book called Arresting Incarceration. If anybody wants to find out more about this, you, you're not going to find the information in The Guardian. Uh, it, it's necessary to go and read um, some objective research and, and analysis. It's 30 bucks on, on Amazon. Um, but what an investment in actually understanding and, and decrypting uh, the one-sided narrative we're, we're getting from from the mainstream media. Look, just on that, I have to complain about the Today Show, uh, Channel 9, and, and maybe multiple other channels. I've been listening to um, the 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 uh, narrative ar around the death of um, David, help me with his last name, people. Lord. No, Floyd. no, not George Floyd, the, the Indigenous Australian who was killed in 2015. Um, Dungay. David Dungay. Uh, and, and so what I'm mostly hearing is that uh, all the comparisons to George Floyd, really, uh, in that just like George Floyd, he was uh, died with a whole bunch of police on top of him saying, I can't breathe, uh, and charges should be laid. And on Q&A last night, the first question was from his mum. And, and look, how tough is it? To, if I if she was face to face right now, it would be so tough to argue with her. Um, but the things she's saying are wrong. Uh, they're just wrong, and and it, it's tragic. And you can't take away the pain from that. But his death was incomparable to George Floyd, other than some trivial similarities. And and I'm not saying his death was trivial, but him saying I can't breathe is one thing. But they're telling the story about how the police were only in there because they wanted to take biscuits off him. What they don't take any time to tell you is that he was hyperglycemic diabetic and they were trying they were concerned for his his health uh, there's this huge part of context which is entirely missing there was no justifiable concern uh, for George Floyd which caused them to be on top of him they were murdering him it was violent brutality and it was completely unjustifiable but there was a royal inquest, sorry, not a royal inquest, but a coroner's inquest into David Dungay's death. And the facts of the matter were well and truly established after coroner's reports and video evidence from beginning to end. There was no cover-up and there was no criminal intent. There was no elements required for a murder conviction at all. It's impossible to lay charges, which is why the magistrate didn't recommend any. There wasn't even disciplinary uh, thing. There were some procedures that... They said they could improve, and and that's fantastic. Let's do the best we can to avoid that kind of tragedy again. And and if anybody's misunderstood me, let me clarify. I don't minimalise the tragedy of David Dungay's death. It's horrible, and we should do everything we can to try and avoid it. But the media are not doing us any favours when they compare or when they allow a guest on their show to compare George Floyd's death with David Dungay's death as, as if that's a reasonable statement. It's unreasonable. There's no evidence which supports racism or murder or, or systemic racism uh, or even police brutality in, in David Dungay's death. Uh, any disagreement from anybody on the panel? Have we still got you, Jacinta? Mm. Uh, we've got some um, got some issues there with 
with that. Um, David, I'm um, I'm interested in everyone's thoughts on the issue of overzealous policing, uh, not necessarily mm. uh, race based, but I, I I I feel there is an issue. I think um, mm. I think uh, there's some uh, uh, regulatory encouragements and protections that are offered to uh, certainly in the American context with qualified immunity. Mm. Um, but uh, even in Australia, there's uh, there's been some uh, some uh, pretty horrible incidents of people dying, uh, particularly by gunshot. Uh, and uh, and whilst it's 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 I don't want to make big conclusions or draw big conclusions or make sweeping statements, I think there is uh, there is possibly an issue um, with, uh, uh, for example, there are regulations that um, that stipulate that when uh, when, uh, say, an intoxicated person or someone uh, is approaching a police with uh, what could be construed as a weapon, uh, that uh, the police are instructed to shoot for the mass, meaning they shoot in the chest. Mm. Uh, they don't. They don't shoot in the leg. They don't shoot. You know. They don't. They don't. You know. So the regulations are there to tell police what to do uh, to protect themselves, um, and there. Uh, and and there, there may be, of course. Um, uh, good reasons for that, of course. I mean, if you're a policeman and you're in these circumstances, then you would want uh, the fr you know you'd want the ability to protect yourself. But uh, but uh, you know, I, I I think there's rising concern. I have some concerns about um, overzealous policing. I um I don't think there's anywhere near the same level of concern in Australia as I don't think there's cause for the same level of concern. In Australia, as there is in America, I, I think there's plenty of incidents of police brutality in America. I think it's an entirely different policing culture um, to to Australia, and I, f mm -hmm. not for a second would I presume that all police are good. Um, but I, I think the incidence is much less in Australia. It's a it's a lot harder to get away with it. Um, and um, you know, I, I saw the stat today. I think it was something like this: thirty thousand police um, in Australia. Uh, that's a huge number. You're definitely going to have bad apples in that bunch. You're definitely going to have yeah. have police who are racial profiling and and uh, racially biased and and maybe not using their discretion in in the way yeah. that they should be. Um, and and I hope that all police officers and are fighting it, extinguishing it, uh, not tolerating it, or looking the other way when when they see it. Um, but the, the the issue is is if we accept that there's a large police force and there are going, of course, to be bad apples amongst such a large body of large number of people, the issue is um, what system is in place to ensure that they get worked out of the uh, police force. And mm. that's where I personally have some concerns. And we've seen historically uh, with issues such as corruption and, uh, 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 you know, being involved in criminal activity, it's not easy. To get rid of bad apples. Um, yep, I've actually. But anyway, got, uh, I, I just want—I'll leave that there. Yeah, uh, uh, no, it, it's worth going there. I want to ask hard questions because um, this isn't uh, something that uh, I guess our side of politics wants to talk about. Um, we we want to essentially emphasise personal responsibility. Um, but you're you're very right. Somebody in the comments said something about a training issue. Now I've got police contacts who have uh, informed me uh, their horror of people who fail some of the police recruitment standards um, who are then invited to come back and reapply to fill certain quotas uh, for for the the equitable outcomes that are required um, mm. and and this is one of this is certainly going to be one of the causative factors people who failed a psychological profile um, for not having the right personality for being in policing. It could be concerns for mental health. Have you got the toughness to survive uh, the demands and the rigours on, on the emotional life of a policeman? Um, but there's other things as well. So uh, there's definitely issues that, that need to be fixed there. I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't want to be misunderstood as, as sweeping those under the rug or, or trivialising them. Uh, jump in, any of uh, the other three. Andrew, I think what you're saying is a really good point. Um, it's good to have a, a forum like this in which we can um, explore, you know, complex issues like that. Um, there's been a lot of really good um, comments um, just coming through uh, about this, about training, in particular about quota systems. Um, you know, 
Uh, I think that that's really uh, an important discussion, and um, I wouldn't want to minimise that at all. Um, I I think the thing that is alarming me in the US is that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, already we're seeing in, in Minnesota they want to you know defund the police, and New, the New York mayor has said that he's going to start defunding the New York police force and put it in the community programs. Uh, now I know you're not saying this, Andrew, at all, so please don't misunderstand me, but um, I, I just think there's a, yes, there are some bad apples. Yes, there's, there are problems. And yes, we should talk about them. At the same time, uh, it worries me deeply when the um, uh, protests in, um, in Martin Place in Sydney, 3,000 people, the major chant that people were having was F the police. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's just not only disgusting but disgraceful that, I mean, there's a lot of good apples in the police force and i know you're not saying this um you raise really important questions i want to qualify that again um uh but i, I think i just want to just quickly and you know affirm that uh i think we actually have a really great police force in australia um mostly um uh whenever i've dealt with the police i've just found them to be actually excellent in we Wall, for instance um when i was there they uh we had um, two or three police officers. And uh, I remember having, as the minister in town, sometimes had to be a witness to um, some of their uh, testimony taking late at night. And I used to say to them, mate, you guys are so nice. Why are you treat you know, these clearly this person has stolen, you know, petrol from the petrol station and just driven off and, um, uh, you know, and, but they just said, look, you just got to treat people with respect if you're, if you're going to get anywhere, particularly in a small country town. Uh, can I just say to people you know, looking on the comments, you know, um, I've often found Evelyn Ray really helpful in this regard and, and she's making just some great points that recruitment is the key. Um, the cold quota system for anything, for politics, for police is a disaster. Um, but, you know, I think Evelyn's right. 98% of all these issues could be solved during the recruitment phase, and that itself is something that we need to look at. I think our, our system is great, but let's look at the recruitment stage and weed out the bad apples there. I think that's a place, a great place to start. Okay, I'll make a couple of comments. Of course, thank uh, you. I can remember there was a copper once I was only young, um, he flogged my backside really hard. <laughs> and, uh, that was my father, and I was never, ever cheeky again. <laughs> <laughs> With regard to criticism, uh, one thing I find interesting, you'll hear the blacktivists get on the social media, and whenever you know, we're talking about the things that they don't like to talk about, they'll respond with, you can't comment until you walk a mile in our shoes. Okay? Yep. A real throwaway line. Yet how many of them have walked in a copper's shoes, um, you know, in order to be able to criticise the cops? Mm, um, yep. Good point. Uh, here's something else interesting. The other thing you always hear is um, why didn't he or she use a taser, okay, when a person gets shot? I have a friend of mine here in Sydney, a good young policeman, and he was telling me, first of all, tasers, are, they're not substitutable for guns, okay? They serve very different purposes. They get used under very different circumstances. And he said, in practice, uh, when they use the ta tasers, um, in practice, they will often use it in such a way that it puts their own lives at risk, but they're trying to minimise harm to the, the person as well. And he said if they would have, um, at the academy, if they did it that way, they would have been failed. I don't know if that's... Wow. Yeah, you know, it's such a... At the academy, they teach them, you know, use the gun, uh, these are certain circumstances because tasers aren't that effective, et cetera, et cetera. But in practice, they will, where possible, they will use tasers in order to preserve uh, life and prevent hurting someone, so... Yep. Mm. Wow. I want to um, just spend some time with Jacinta because uh, she's got about uh, five to ten minutes maximum um, before she has to go and do her next interview. Um, and uh, we're very grateful for your time again, two weeks in a row. We've been spoiled. Uh, but, 
<laughs> she is. Uh, we've been been very blessed to, to have her with us. Um, but uh, such an important topic going on in the community at the moment that um, uh, I certainly don't want, you know, look, I don't discount my voice because of my skin colour, but uh, I do value having uh, different experiences and different perspectives talking about the data and the facts um, together. Um, Jacinda, I wanted you to spend a couple of minutes um, specifically talking about uh, some questions that we've had before tonight, but um, just before you're going, talking about how do we get more concern uh, about the justice outcomes, the disparities um, for for Indigenous Australians, especially as, as you experience outside the cities where most of us live um, in the very remote regions? How do we not just hand money and throw money at the problem, but how do we increase uh, dignity and um, esteem and purpose and and functionality uh, in in the cultural problems which are so endemic um, to the Aboriginal experience in Australia. No pressure. Um, <laughs> um, look, I, I, let me let me um, let me take some pressure off. It's not going to be a quick. There's no quick solutions. There's, there's no, no silver solution. bullets. Um, no, it, it may no, take several isn't. generations, but what direction should we be heading in? Um, well, and, and last week, uh, the common thing that we uh, we said was, don't do anything, don't treat us differently. Mm, but um, mm, if, mm. if people want to do something, uh, political pressure. Um, yeah. Well, I think Your we've turn. got to keep shining a light on what's really going on. And look, I, I, earlier tonight I, had, um, I spoke with Peter Credlin on her program and she said, that she would, um, if I would accept it, she would come to Alice Springs and, um, and and bring the cameras. And because I said, look, I could take some, I could take anybody on a tour of this community and show them places um, where different family members of mine have been murdered in these different, you know, I mean, it's right throughout the Northern Territory and tell their story. And and that's what I think is dehumanising. I mean. You know, we didn't, we, 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 everyone saw what happened to George Floyd. No one actually sees what happens to these women and to these children. And so it takes away that human element. And the media, and I, and I read one of the messages earlier, is that the media have a role to play and they are not playing that role effectively enough. I mean, mm. they are exploiting the situation. Q&A exploit the situation they they have in as far as i'm concerned have exploited the mother of da dave and dungai the way that they mm. you know when you have someone um appear on a program like that and express their beliefs which don't necessarily align with the truth no one is going to be prepared to challenge that Such so a that fair point. becomes accepted and the mm. same thing happens with the whole Black Lives Matter movement because, well, the Aboriginal deaths in custody, because I know of circumstances where some of those deaths in custody, some of those individuals have been um, uh, not, well, certainly not the victim of police brutality, but I know of a particular one very close to home. The individual was a convicted gang rapist, um, had served time previously for that, was um, a prolific um, DV abuser, uh, was an individual who uh, drank a lot, who was suffering from pre-existing pre medical conditions and was actually uh, in a different town at the time receiving medical treatment for one of these conditions, but went on a drinking binge, uh, committed a crime, was arrested and died in custody. And that person was then held up as another poor Indigenous victim, you know, fallen victim to black deaths in custody to the statistics. And, and then the opportunist in that individual's family went at police and, and said, well, we're, we're going to take this to court, we're, we're going to demand justice and also, you know, look for compensation, monetary compensation for the situation. And you have to wonder how often has this ever occurred in many of those cases? 
Yep. And the way the media run with it is not to actually look any further than uh, the person's skin colour and that they've died in custody and that's enough. And, again, you know, that we're not... There's, it's just dancing above the surface and this unwillingness to get deeper and underneath and, and understand what is really actually going on. Um, and, and much of the media does not do us any favours whatsoever. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, much of the, the left media are about, uh, are about being seen as allies to Aboriginal people, uh, mm -hmm. is about making money, is about maintaining their status, uh, maintaining their ability to uh, create clickbait. That's all yep. it comes down to. There is no real care for the plight of marginalised Aboriginal people. Yeah. Um, Evelyn Ray wants to uh, know, um, Jacinta and Anthony, how you two are viewed in the wider Indigenous communities. We know how uh, academics respond to you, um, but uh, just in, in your everyday lives, um, just, out and about in the communities. Before, um, before I go, sorry, can yeah. I just answer that one quickly before I go? After Thanks, both. Jacinta. Um, Look, I'm I'm more and more that I'm um, speaking up about these issues. I, I I've made enemies in my own family, which is fine by me, because um, I think it's important to begin with your own family and to call these sorts of things out. And you know, I've been threatened that if I go to Yundamu, I'll get bashed. Um, well, not actually necessary by my family. My close close family are appalled by the way that I'm treated. Are utterly appalled and heartbroken. And I think they're far more affected by the abuse that I cop online um, that they're slowly learning more about uh, than I am because I'm sort of used to it. Um, but there are a hell of a lot of silent Indigenous people out there who are very thankful for my voice and for Anthony's voice. And there are those who are just far too petrified to express any um, support publicly because of the incredible backlash that they will receive from their own family, mm -hmm. from the wider community, you know, if you don't, if you don't adhere to the mob, people, you, you, you are very likely putting yourself at risk of violence yourself. So yep. it is dangerous for some people to come out and to support us publicly. Mm -hmm. um, but w social media provides a platform for cowards to attack in great numbers. And, in fact, I've been, you know, there's uh, white progressives who have, you know, commented online and said, well, I wouldn't believe anything that Jacinta says because, look, her people don't even support her. What I say to that is they're not my people. My people are decent human beings of all different backgrounds who are prepared to confront the difficult issues in, in, truthful, in a truthful way to find practical ways forward. They are who my people are. Don't, yep. you know, I don't belong to the Indigenous race. Mm. I, I belong to me. And um, uh, the best thing you can do for people, if you care about them, no matter what their background is, is allow them to have a voice, allow uh, it to be an honest uh, pursuit of what the truth is. Yeah. Um, you know, I know you've got to go, but can I just say, I, I think there's a lot of love and respect for you and Anthony in the wider community. And I think what's great about you both is you model what reconciliation really looks like. It's not us and them, but it's we. So thank you yep. for all that you do. And uh, yep. I know I can speak on that alone. I know there's a lot of people out there that, uh, you know, really, really respect what you do. So thank you. Yep. Thank Huge you. fan. Thank you, Jacinta. Thank you. I just said that. Anthony, uh, how do you answer this question? Um, would you say you're in the minority with your political social views? Yeah, um, I don't know if minority is, is the right word. Certainly, there's you know there's a you know, there's a critical mass that despise me, hate everything I say, and much like Jacinta, because I, I follow Jacinta closely, um, the people that despise us to try and get an argument out of them about what's wrong with us is like getting blood out of out of a stone. Yeah. 
<laughs> the, the, the most sophisticated comments are like, dissenter Jac doesn't talk, doesn't um, represent me. And that's it. Or, Anthony, you're a coconut. Uh, you know, and that's the level of sophistication you get. Um, yeah. So, yeah, look, there's, there's a lot of knockers. But with regard to the, like the, most recent article I had on news.com.au, the amount of people that sent in positive emails to me was great. And I, I know many, many Indigenous people too who just tell me, they say, Anthony, we need more voices like you. So, you know, I don't know what the ratio is, but there's certainly enough um, sensible Indigenous people out there who support what I'm doing and what Jacinta is doing as well. Yeah. Anthony, um, can I ask you a question? Would you, in your estimation, would you say that you get more support from so-called white fellas than you do from black fellas? If I probably, but that's because there's more of them out there anyway to begin with. <laughs> you know, so again, you know, they're ninety-seven percent of the population, so yeah, that's where most of my support is going to come from. But you, you've spoken at a number of our conferences, yeah, um, and universally. You and Jacinta has two, and Warren Mundine. I mean, they 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 flock in to listen to you talk. There's so I mean, much goodwill, in, uh, from what I observe, uh, oh, yeah. from the broader Australian community for the plight of Aboriginal people, and they yes. they desperately want. That's why we tolerate thirty billion dollars being spent on this problem because we all desperately want to find a solution. <laughs> exactly the, right. The amount of goodwill there from your average Aussie. Mm. Mm for Aboriginal people is huge. It's enormous. Yeah. And these loud activists who like to say F you, and by the way, um, you know, those images where, you know, a dead cop's a, a good cop and F you and that sort of thing. Could you imagine if a non-Aboriginal body produced an equivalent sort of meme image yeah. targeted mm. at Aboriginal people, it would be the biggest headline for a week. Yep. It would be... Yeah. Absolutely shocking. So, yeah, when I go to Liberty Fest, Andrew, yeah, I mean, they're good people to begin with. So, you know, um, yeah, so the goodwill for, you know, from your average Aussie for the down and out Aboriginal person is huge. The support for people like Jacinta, Warren and myself, it's huge. Um, and Aboriginal people, again, especially the noisy ones, need to be careful because they, you know, I think there's still going to be a lot of goodwill there forever for a long time, but don't test it too much, mm. you know. Don't take it for granted. Um, and particularly, too, if, you know, everyone has a, a point where they, they slip, they break or whatever, imagine this. You're a health worker, you, you're on the front line, you're a copper or whatever, you're a firefighter. You're not going to be perfect every time. And if, you, if you've had a few experiences where that week you've been spat on by an Aboriginal person, you've been cursed, all those sorts of things. Don't be surprised if once in a while one of those uh, service providers just thinks, you know, and they go to, to help you, they're mm. just not giving 100%. They might think, stuff it, you know? Yeah. Well, and that, yeah, that would be often, but, that would yeah. surely be a, um, a, a precipitator of racial bias that, you know, there might be police out there who who, uh, you know, you're going to call it racial profiling, but if it's based on experience and, and based uh, on, you know, uh, the realities of the situation is is that that's the kind of treatment you've gotten that over and over and over again, uh, where we saw a video of a, a kid, I think, in, in Sydney, um, Aboriginal kid who was being detained by police and the policeman swept his legs out from, from under him and, and put him down seconds before the kid had been abusing the cop and swearing at him um and you know i we don't have the whole picture and i'm never justifying uh you know unprofessional behavior from from police but um you are going to find that if you treat police that way look i can remember the first time when tasers came out and i saw some footage uh, outrage on the news um that uh, it had been used on an on an underage um person um and I can remember my thought initially being, if that was my kid, I wouldn't be angry at the cops. I would be mortified that a cop thought it was necessary um, to do that to my child. The, I would assume the cop um, 
was acting reasonably and that my child had been abusing the police and, and giving them uh, some concern for their own safety. And, and you just can't do that and expect the cops to be professional all the time. They're only people. Can I just add, and actually Andrew might have some good thoughts on this. Um, you've been quiet tonight, mate, so I'll give you a, <laughs> give you a hit for this. Um, it's interesting to note um, the protest is trying with George Floyd, um, a, a career criminal over in America who was, uh, we now know from the autopsy results, high on um, methamphetamine and um, another drug and also had COVID. Um, and um, so mass protests, 30,000 people. Justine Damon, an Aussie, is innocently shot um, by... By the same um, police department. Police, same police department, a black police officer mm. um, in, in America. The only protests were uh, for the police officer that he had been targeted because he was a Muslim. Yep. Um, mm. You know, why is this there such a disparity between the two? And, uh, uh, Andrew, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts from a, a, a libertarian point of view. Uh, look. Um, I don't think my thoughts are particularly original in that respect. I think everyone would share these and that and that uh, and I go back to you know libertarianism is all about you don't hurt people and you don't take their stuff. but I guess the other word is just hypocrisy. like there's just so much hypocrisy in these all these issues um, and uh, you know and and these issues they get, they get appropriated by people with uh, vested interests. Mm. Uh, and I just think, um, it, but it's so emotive. I, I mentioned it before. I just feel it's just so emotive, and 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 there's so much emotion involved in these issues that and that are fed by the media because they're they're they've got a vested interest, right? Emotion sells stories. Riots sell papers. Uh, mm. They bring viewers to the TV. So everyone's got a vested interest to kind of stir this up, and uh, mm. calmer heads just don't prevail in the short term. Uh, and we've, we've seen it this year. Surely yeah. the word for this year, uh, and it's a word that's banned from this show, but for the sake of saying it's banned from this show, I'm going to say it. It's the word unprecedented. Uh, it's mm. disaster porn. It's what the news wants to show all the time is is the worst, the biggest. If it bleeds, it leads. Uh, you know, we've got the bush fires. We've got... Uh, then we've got COVID, and it's just wall-to-wall -wall coverage, twenty-four-seven on on every channel. And and um, I actually thought they were a bit slow on the uptake with uh, the race riots in America, but um, then they just won't stop. And and it's all one-sided, and it's all one narrative. And it's um, yeah, the media's got a lot to answer for uh, with that. And and obviously, uh, I want to well, maybe not obviously, but I want to add there's there's lots of good media people as well, and. Some of them get on on this show, uh, thankfully, um, every every now mm. and then. Mm. Awesome. Well, I think we're just about coming to the the end of our end of our steam. Uh, any any final thoughts, gentlemen? No, just thank you, Dave. Really appreciate it. it it's um, it's nice having a chat. Good to connect with the um, two guys. Hey, this is like a little little bit like a Brady Bunch scene, you know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's good to connect with um, Your Dave, and, Dave and Andrew. Um, not so good to connect with you, Mark. No, only kidding, only kidding. <laughs> Mark, Mark, given that I live in Strathfield, why don't we catch up for a... We should do that. Coffee I live in Strathfield. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Um, so uh, we can email afterwards or... Sounds um, good. Pass on our numbers and um, I think you're uh, all carbon copied together uh, on the um, right. the run sheet for tonight. Um, cool. Got each other there, but I can text you each other's phone numbers and everything. So uh, yeah, welcome yeah, everybody yeah. to this private conversation, organising drinks. Andrew, when are you <laughs> you and I catching up? Dave, well, we we can't get down to Strathfield, can we yet, uh, Dave? Because our uh, We're not crazy allowed out. premier, the <laughs> crazy premier, thinks that closing what? the borders here is great. There's three Queenslanders here. What's the go with your premier? Yeah. <laughs> you tell us, you know. Queenslanders. Uh, what we what we vote what we vote for in Queensland is somebody who will promise a committee to make every decision at election time. Oh, oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. help Crazy. us. So, <laughs> uh, so that's all good. Look, uh, thank you very much for watching tonight, uh, dear viewers. Uh, your comments, your interaction has been wonderful. Thank you for sharing the show. Um, we'll be in the same place 
next Tuesday night, 8 p.m., uh, we have uh, some special guests lined up and uh, some still yet to be confirmed. Uh, if there's anybody you'd like to see on the show, uh, why don't you send them a message and ask them to reach out and uh, let's have a chat. Um, send me a message. I'll reach out to them as well. We're always looking for um, a couple of regulars and a couple of new people uh, every week. And um, what we're just trying to do is have conversations about important public issues and uh, make sure that we're having them honestly, open to um, saying things that we don't want to hear, making you uncomfortable, making us uncomfortable. Um, the, the big phrase that we hear about reconciliation is truth telling. That's all we're trying to do. We want to have uh, difficult conversations and, and have them well. Um, and, and that's uh, really important if we're going to uh, be telling the truth and moving forward as a society. But uh, that's it for this episode of Pello Talk. Really appreciate you tuning in and uh, make sure you subscribe to the newsletter and updates because you never know when we're going to get kicked off uh, YouTube and Facebook. So you can get to the uh, newsletter at Dave Pello com where you'll also be able to uh, put a little financial contribution in if uh, if you've enjoyed the show tonight and you'd like to see it keep going uh, I promise unlike Q a uh, there is no taxpayer funding going into the creation of this production um, but it's been wonderful uh, chatting with you and uh, we will see you in the comments section <laughs>